Hello everyone, welcome to week six. Uh, this is the third, third video of uh, Grasshopper week six. And um, this is an example we're going to try to do, or something similar, at least in terms of the parametric logic of it. Uh, it's what I call um, the pineapple tower. And this is uh, just an image to kind of give you an idea of the direction uh, that this is going. Okay, so as you can see, this is a sort of blobby surface, whatever. Uh, and there's a either quad or diamond subdivision with a circle in the center and that's sort of offset outwards. Um, and basically a surface is created between those two, right? So we basically have to find a subdivision method that gives us the diamonds or the quad outlines and find a way to draw uh, a circle in the center of these cells and offset it outwards a little bit and then loft it. Okay, so that's the uh, broad idea. Um, usually, when you do something comp more complicated like this, I tend to start out simple. Um, so let's just use a uh, surface primitive, um, a cylinder. Okay, this is a cylinder component, and um, can make let's say a slider to kind of get it make it bigger so 0 to 50.0 and that will be let's duplicate that that will be radius and length so let's make the radius something like 20 or you can double click and just enter it and length 50 okay and we can sort of tweak that as we go. Um, 15, whoops. 15. And maybe we'll eventually want to be higher, but let's see. Okay. So this is the input geometry. Uh, as always, when you're kind of dealing with this, lunchbox is your best companion. And I'm going to use the diamond panels for this. Surface. I'm going to hide the cylinder, and you can kind of see this already. Uh, if you're trying to kind of zoom into this, you can highlight, let's say, the output uh, component spacebar and go here to zoom to that geometry. Okay. Uh, 0 to 20. Let's get some of these subdivisions in place. U and V, and let's say 16 to. And I'm just kind of uh, winging this just to kind of get a sense of okay, what's roughly a quad square ish panel? And obviously, this is something you can change. Okay. So, uh, what we want to do um, is to find a way to draw circles here. Uh, if we go to curve primitive, you'll see that there are a lot of ways to draw circles, right? But you want to kind of find a way to draw a circle where you can control the radius, first of all, but also control the sort of direction that the circle is facing, right? So these don't really work, three point doesn't really work. This needs the base plane and the radius, it might work. So we go to our center, normal, and radius. Actually, this is the more interesting one if you look at the uh, icon, right? Because if I can find, remember in the last video, we were you know, finding ways to draw the normal vector, right? We want to basically analyze this surface and find its normal vector at the center of this surface, of this panel. So we just need a normal vector. So actually, this is probably um, one of the ways, best ways for us to proceed. Okay, all right. So here are our problems. Center point, which is somewhere here, right? And obviously, because this gives us the diamonds, um, also triangles, which is the sort of uh, end panels, uh, where are those? Those are over here, right? Where the seam is, right? So we might kind of miss out on some of those. So let's just ignore those for now. Um, let's grab the diamonds and um, actually let's just uh, 
we can do a simple area, right? Your best sort of buddy to find uh, the centroids. Oops. Wrong one. Okay. So those are the area centroids um, of each panel. Okay. <coughs> so now of the centroids, uh, I kind of want to poke around and see what I can find in terms of finding something that lets me evaluate the surface at this point. It's very similar to uh, in the curves where we have this, the point on curve, evaluates a curve at a specific location, right, and lets us kind of move it to the midpoint or wherever and use that. So we want to kind of find the surface version of this, right? So to poke around in the surface uh, tab analysis, you'll see that there is evaluate surface, evaluate the surface properties at a UV corner. Okay, let's pop that in. Base surface, UV corner to evaluate. Okay, so base surface we know because base surface is basically these diamonds, right? This is trickier. We need a UV coordinate to evaluate, which is basically the center of the surface. And we have to find a component that spits out uh, the UV coordinate of this. Um, and there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can actually enter UV coordinates. And you could actually, technically, you could actually just enter UV coordinates, right? And if this surface is going 0 to 1, 0 to 1 in terms of its overall sort of address system, right, if you will, right? The same way curves have 0 to 1, except now this is three-dimensional. It stands to reason that the sort of center point of this, actually the address, is half and half, right? So 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So let's see. 0 0.5, comma, 0 0.5. Okay. And let's push that into UV. And so something pops up not quite what you expect. It's actually kind of in the corner, right? And you can actually see how this works if you do, let's say, 5 comma 5. And it actually moves somewhere. But how do I know? Obviously, it's not working off of the same scale as we're expecting. How do I know? How do I get this into the center? So I'll actually undo this, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and actually by reparameterizing the surface, Right click, reparameterize. And this actually just sticks it into the middle. The reparameterize basically looks at a surface and refits it so the surface is exactly 1, 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1 on both sides, regardless of whatever you know operations happened to it before. So this is a kind of a easy, lazy version way to actually get this, uh, this sort of surface uh, normal. All right now, this is one version. Uh, one of the other versions I use a lot actually is a command or a component here called surface closest point. If you drop this in, you'll find that it asks you for a point, a sample point, and a base surface. And it basically pulls uh, the closest point you know on the surface, uh, pulls to that surface, right? So the surface you want to give it, at least um, in this case, is you know the diamonds. The point you want to give it is the centroids, right? So that, and you'll see these basically. And I'll close that. These basically overlap over there, except it gives me uh, the UV coordinates, right? Okay. So in this case. With this eval, I d actually don't need to reparameterize this because we're not basing this off of you know some uh, basically a pure mathematical address, and you pull up in the UV coordinates for this. And in some ways, you'll find that this actually uh, can be a more robust solution because you're not sort of subjected to the whims of w what the geometry does. This is a geometric solution that will kind of stay true. Um, regardless of how the geometry changes, okay. So that's why, um, in a certain way, 
I kind of prefer this solution sometimes, and this actually will come in useful in um, more situations, more often than not. All right? Okay, so we have our normal vectors now, and remember you can visualize it if you need to. Um, display vector, vector display, give it an anchor point, which is the point of UV, give it a vector. You see the little arrows popping up just to kind of check your work right okay so let's go back to curve primitive circle C and R all right center point still here right normal direction or normal vector which obviously we grabbed and so you'll see the circles are orienting correctly and sort of outwards flat against the surface and then a radius right okay the radius we can just do a simple say 3.0 slider for now but eventually we'll actually want to fine-tune um, the control of these radiuses to prevent the radius from getting too large, right? If the radius gets too large, uh, let's say here, I do five, then it will outstep the boundaries, which may be what you want. Let's say I think I think uh, some of the Louis Vuitton buildings actually do this, right? Um, but in our case, we don't want it. Okay. Now the other half of this equation is actually we want to offset the surface outwards or just move it outwards, right? We actually don't need to do offset here because we already have a normal vector that's going outwards, right? So we can just do that. So we can just use the move, translate or move an object along a vector, right? And take these circles. That's the geometry we want to move and a translation vector which is this so you'll see it's moving outwards but we want to be able to control how much it moves outwards and hide this control Q so you need to multiply that vector right the same thing um, I'll just copy this take that vector Oops times 3 in this case and push it back in. So you'll see now I'm controlling how much it offsets. Alright, right, simple enough. And the last step is to actually just what? Loft it. So loft. Now, uh, we need to actually kind of match our loft curves, right? And um, you'll see we have the circles already, which are these outer ones, and we need to find these guys, okay? And as always, there's a couple ways you can do it, but the diamonds, <coughs> these are surfaces. So we actually need to grab the edges of the surfaces, these subsurfaces. So what we'll need to do is good old Deconstruct BREP. Right? Deconstruct BREP goes here. So we get, whoops, Control Q. So we get faces, edges, and vertices. Right? And edges, we can either do the edges and join them um, by, let's say, join curves, because these are. The edges are individual, four sides, right? You can join them to get the curves, or you can take the vertices of a BREP and do a polyline and redraw them while making sure you close the polyline. So this has to be set to, this Boolean has to be set to true. Um, so you see it actually goes around the vertices and closes it back instead of being a three-sided, you know, open polyline. These more or less uh, would do the same thing, okay? 
So you'll see the joined, this is the same thing. You basically get an output of what, 68 curves, 68 polylines, more or less the same. All right? Um, okay. So you can try these, both of these, they, they basically do the same thing. Now we'll have to loft this, so let's try this into the curve. Nothing happens yet because we need another and this. Now remember, if we take a look at this, remember that different data types don't match. And you'll have trouble with it when you try to do something like that, right? You'll see that this is these are all in their own sublists, right? This is in one big ginormous long list. And so you'll know that we will have some problem with that. So to kind of get this to correspond one to one, we will have to graph this guy, right? So you can either do it at the output here, or if you want to be more explicit, then put a graph component between this, so you see that, okay, now we have matching data types. Hold down the shift key to add it in. <coughs> so the pur for the purpose of our example, we'll just go with the polyline version, because I generally like sort of redrawing this geometry to make sure it's clean and the direction of the curves are all consistent, right? So they kind of come around, there's no surprises. All right. So a loft asks for section curves and there's a loft options. So we are basically pushing this into here. But let's say, for example, you can see that this is a dotted line, whereas this is a solid line. And you can tell almost right away, remember what we talked about in terms of lofting a one-to-one -one things or things that need to correlate one-to-one. -one that data types you usually want to try to match them. And so what we'll have to do here to get this to match that is to actually graft things. And you can graft the output like this so you get that or if you want to be sort of more explicit you can just do have a component so you can actually more clearly read what's going on. So holding down the shift key add this into there and you'll see this now there's some strange stuff going along like that where you're kind of getting this suction cup and this is actually from the seams not aligning aligning correctly right uh, this happens when you loft things as well you kind of sometimes you have to adjust the seams so that's where this thing comes in the loft options so loft options that and what you want to change is the second one adjust seams with a boolean toggle you can right click and set boolean to true or false as well but this is the same like you know this makes it more explicit so it's easier to read turn that to true and your seams should auto adjust okay all right, so that's done for this part. We kind of have the geometry. Um, you'll have the sort of leftover triangles from the center. That's something you have to deal with uh, separately. Um, that's a little bit more complicated in terms of trying to grab those, right? But that's life. Uh, it comes with the diamond pattern, right? Because the ending never ends correctly. Okay, but now, as you can see, I can change the offset, right? My problem is what happens when, you know, this? My circles get too large and they start to intersect and a lot of weird things happen and the whole thing maybe just starts to fall apart, right? Okay. So we have to come up with some sort of logic that restricts the radius of a circle and makes it so that the radius of a circle never goes beyond, let's say, the largest size of the cell. So to do this, we'll go back here, backtrack a little bit, 
and um, actually go to our good friend Curve Analysis. Uh, let's see where it is. Curve closest point. All right. Let's see what asks. Ask for a point to project onto a curve and a curve to project onto. Okay. And what we're going to use is actually uh, the area centroids from here. Now project them to the sides of each uh, of these, right? And then basically measure the distance between them. So you basically kind of get the larger sort of uh, inner circumscribed circle that this uh, sort of diamond or this quad can take, right? So it's almost the same thing. It would be more or less the same thing as you drew a circle or measure the distance between, let's say, the midpoints of this cell and that cell. Right? And like I said, with Grasshopper, there's always multiple ways of doing it. So you can, can actually, for example, as an alternative, you can do the uh, point on curve, take the edges, find all of their midpoints, right? And then find a way basically to isolate and just like measure the distances between these, right? which is one way. Um, and to just kind of show you really quick, if you look at these, you know, it's the same sort of setup, 0, 1, 2, 3, and you would just list, you know, opposite points. Like this. That and that. And then in this item, set integer 0. In this item, set integer three, which should be the opposite one, here and here, or not, actually, two, sorry, this and this, right? And then to kind of check, you can draw a line between them. Make sure that line is the sort of longest crossing, right? Measure distance. between those two, so that and that. This distance, this basically, this value is the largest value that your radius, uh, or your, um, not radius, but diameter of the circle can be. So you have to divide that by two, and that will kind of constrain this. Right? So, you know, really quickly, that's, you know, one way to kind of get to the value that we're looking for. Now I'm. This is also, you know, a geometrical method. I'm doing something a little bit different, but I will. Oops. I will actually just pull this to the side so you can see that as well. And this is also a valid solution. Okay. This as well. All right. So what I'm doing here um, is using the curve closest point, projecting it to the sides like we had earlier. Let me hide this. And. We're going to take the edges as the curve to project onto, so here. And as you can see, the data type is this, right? The points we want to project are these, the area centroids, right? Now you'll see that you get something really weird, right? And when you see that, automatically you go, okay, uh, my data probably isn't matching, okay? So let's just try to graph it. Once you graphed it, then it makes sense, right? There should be four on each side, uh, four in each cell, one on each side. Okay, so up to here, this all makes sense, and I'm just kind of doing this with you know slightly fancier components, just kind of introduce new things, right? Although obviously you can still do this sort of mathematical version, which you know even though it's simple and dumb, it still works. Okay, here, let's look at that point on the curve that's closest, parameter, and distance. So we actually have a distance between here and here, the base point and that point, right? That's the radius already, right? Okay. If we test the values right now, they're all identical, okay? But once we start messing with the geometry, there's a possibility that the, then things shift or 
you know, for example, the diamonds, you know, get asymmetrical um, if I kind of swap this out, right? So we actually want something, some sort of logic that can be perhaps a little bit more robust than this. And so, so if you go to math domain, the first one we'll use is bounds. Create a numeric domain which encompasses a list of numbers. The way this works, let's say I have a list of numbers 0, oh actually that's 2, and if I make it multi-line, so 2, you know, 5, 4, 11. Okay? If you give it that, the result you'll get is basically a number domain that finds the smallest number and the largest number. So it grabs your smallest and largest, 2 to 11. Okay? So the reason we're using this is that we can look at the distances. And let's just say, for example, you have a number of different distances, right? So you want to basically use this to kind of find what your smallest and your largest numbers are. And so that's what we would do. In this case, because right now, for now, these are all identical, so your domains are basically identical. All right? The next component you use in the domain as well is deconstruct domain, D domain. So this is asking for a domain, a base domain. Um, if we're using the earlier example of this, 2 to 11, what this does is it splits out the 2 and the 11. It gives us the start and the end of a domain. Okay. So same thing here. And what we want in this case is essentially we want the start of the domain because that's going to be the smallest value. That's going to be the smallest number in, let's say, if we do measuring between all four points, the smallest one that is present. And that's the one we want to be, you know, the biggest radius that this circle can go to. Okay? So that's what this is doing. This is basically grabbing, finding the minimum value, the smallest value of diameters that we're measuring. Because in the end, a lot of these, it's entirely possible that not every cell um, is going, or not every diamond is going to be equally sized eventually when you start messing with this. All right. So the next thing that happens is let's do a minimum comparison. Return the lesser of two items. All right? So it compares, and so we want the start to go in. Notice the data type. This is actually multiple. Okay. And our circle radius that was here actually goes into there. All right? And let me I'll make that for now. Okay. Now let's look at what happens. 2.6. Okay. So basically it ends or makes the largest possible number here 3.77, even though I'm giving it a 5. Okay. So it's comparing what it's getting here. 3.77 and 5 and say, well, the smaller value is 3.77, so I'm going to give it 3.77, right? Now, because data types, right, this is a data type that's in its own compartments, small list, so you will, you will see that there's only one value here, and so this basically applies to every single one. It gets cross apply to every single one. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is then push this into the radius instead. And you get something strange going on, right? Because our outputs here our outputs here don't match the inputs anymore for the circle, right? The this is multi-list uh, data where this is single list data. So here, in this case, you will have to plan it again to get that back. Right? So you'll see that this allows me to kind of scroll it down, down, down. Actually, let, let me 
add one more integer to this so it's smoother. And as soon as I go below 3.5 or 3. Point something, 3.77, then it allows me to resize it again. Okay? So that's how this part of the logic works, and it's pretty interesting um, kind of way to deal with situations that you know might break your grasshopper script. Right? So this is basically why I'm showing you this at this point. All right. So we have this working, uh, but it's still a dumb cylinder, right? And uh, so you can model your own, you know, uh, cylinder, lofted circle, uh, lofted surface, and try it out. See how it works. See how it breaks. Um, especially something that's you know non-uniform. So kind of see how things react. Um, for example. Make a couple circles. Actually, do this. And Shift drag to scale uniform. And let's say let's loft that. Okay. Pop in a surface. That's this. And let's just replace that. Okay. So you'll see it also will cross apply to these situations as well. And depending on your normal vector, it'll go out in different directions. Right? So test it out, try it out, see how it reacts, you know. Um, we'll do next week, the, uh, I'll introduce something else uh, called the graph mapper that actually kind of lets you control uh, these shapes within Grasshopper. Uh, but I think this is it for now.